My name is Eric Story. I'm the host for this evening. Um, I am a PhD candidate in the Department of History at Wilfrid Laurier University, as well as the outreach manager here at the Laurier Centre for the Study of Canada. Now, we at the Laurier Centre for the Study of Canada would like to acknowledge that we are located on the traditional territories of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples, and we recognize the continuing presence of Indigenous peoples and cultures here. The consequences of the long colonial relationship between the Government of Canada and First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples are far-reaching and painful. We are committed to reconciliation through the establishment and maintenance of a mutually respectful relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. Now, before I introduce our speaker tonight, which I'm very, very excited to do, I do have just a few announcements for you all. You actually maybe just saw it behind me uh, just a few seconds ago. Uh, we just put out the call for papers for the our annual Canadian Military History Colloquium. I believe this is our 34th year that we're going to be running it. Um, papers are due, or submissions, I should say, abstracts to present at the conference are due on the 3rd of March. Um, of course, we encourage all aspects of Canadian military history, whether it's the war, or the, whether it's the military side or the war and society side. Um, but this year, many of you will know, is the 100th anniversary of the Royal Canadian Air Force. Um, and so in particular, we encourage um, submissions based upon that topic. Um, Second announcement, um, for those who are in Guelph, um, or maybe even are willing to do the commute to Guelph tomorrow, uh, Tara Brookfield, she's at Laurie Brantford, is going to be speaking at the Guelph Civic Museum at 7 o'clock p.m., just like, just like tonight, on children and the Cold War, um, and the peace activism that took place on Grindstone Island in Ontario, I believe from the 50s until the 70s. So if you're interested, they would love to have you out. Um, Ken may even be on uh, in the Zoom audience tonight, so I'm sure Ken uh, and the folks at the Guelph Civic Museum would be very happy to have you out. Now, let's turn things over. Let me introduce, sorry, our speaker for this evening, uh, Jeff Hayes. He's a professor of history at the University of Waterloo. He's a fellow here at the Laurier Centre for the Study of Canada and editor-in-chief of Canadian Military History, the journal we publish out of here and have done so since 1992. His most recent book, Criar's Left Tenants, Inventing the Canadian Junior Army Officer, 1939-45, was published with the University of British Columbia Press in 2017. Unfortunately, we don't have any physical copies here. I thought we had some. Jeff thought he had some. Turns out neither of us had any, <laughs> but that's okay. Yes, they're so popular. Uh, so many Christmas gifts were given out of Career's left tenants that we don't have any left. Um, but we do have a discount code for you that you can enter um, on the University of British Columbia's uh, press's website. So if you are interested in that, um, you're more than well, we'll share it with you and you can go and do that after the event tonight. Uh, for those here in the room, uh, we do have a couple of copies of some of Jeff's earlier books, The Links and Canada and the Second World War, which is an edited collection uh, in honor of Terry Kopp, um, a number of essays on Canada and the Second World War. So we'll be more than happy to sell those afterwards if you are at all interested in them. Now, those are some of his earlier publications, but tonight he's actually going to be speaking Speaking about some of his newest research that will be coming out in a book in the near future um, on morale in the Canadian Army during the Second World War. And that is what he's going to be speaking to tonight. I will turn it over to Jeff to tell you more about that research that he's doing. Oh, it's green. I'm not sure. If, I don't think I need to use a microphone for here, but we'll see how we go. I lied. I have one copy of Career's Lieutenants. And, uh, uh, oh, that's going to help me too. Thank you. But I know that I didn't buy, I bought it at the full price. So if I sell it to you, I lose money, you know, which may or may not be a tactic that I want to uh, pursue. Although I didn't take the entrepreneurial side here. Thank you for the invitation, Eric. Thank you everyone for coming out on such a cold and uh, chilly night. And uh, my, my project is uh, 
an attempt to try to understand something about the problem of morale in the Canadian Army in the during the Second World War. And um, I, I'm, it's a problem because the idea of morale is one of those things that everyone seems to know about, but nobody can really define it. It has to do with any number of different things, and certainly in our, our recent challenges in Ukraine, we talk a great deal about the uh, power of morale of the Ukrainian people against uh, against Russian incursions. So we know that morale is important, but it's a it's a fascinating problem to discover because it takes us down so many different avenues. And I'd like to take you down one of those tonight. The um, uh, idea of morale, and I'll show you where I'm going here. So the challenge of wartime morale is is one that uh, consistently needs definition, it seems. Every, every country, every kind of institution seems to want to define it. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Canadian Army, as late as 1943, was trying to define what morale was. And we realized that, and I guess I'm kind of almost showing you a table of contents, Morale takes us down, as I say, many different roads. There's no doubt that leadership is a central part of morale, whether it's general leadership or junior officer leadership. But I've written a book about that. And I didn't realize, I don't think I ever used the word morale in that whole book, which seems kind of silly. But in many ways, I'm setting that aside. For some of us, of course, uh, morale is about the immediate comforts of uh, of, of life and in military life, the idea of money, mail, and meals, the three M's are obviously important. And that certainly sets us aside. There's a great deal of rivalry between the British and the Canadians, in part because the Canadians are paid more. And, and then, of course, they're both jealous of the Americans who are paid even more. But we can't underestimate the importance of mail. We can't underestimate the importance of food. As soon as the Canadians get overseas, they start taking rations from British Army uh, canteens. And there's really an ex extraordinary attempt to realize that Canadians do not like mutton. And, and they don't want it. And so there's a kind of early revolution of sorts as they realize that Canadian cooks need to cook food that Canadian appetites will, will deal with. Um, I've highlighted three elements that that and I'm talking about this through the kind of eyes of Colonel Stacy, who's the official army historian of the Second World War. And as I'll mention in a moment, uh, when we look at the problem of morale, and he makes brief mention of it in the first volume of the army history, Six Years of War, he certainly spends a great deal of time talking about the auxiliary services, the groups, the Knights of Columbus, the Legion, the Salvation Army, and the YMCA, who were all collectively brought in to understand something about leave centers, canteens, and entertainments. Stacy feels uh, quite an affinity for those people. Padres as well, the spiritual uplift that they provide is certainly central to morale. As, as scholars, John Maker, for instance, who was once a student here, has written quite nicely. On another level, of course, morale is driven by uh, well, military priorities, military training and resilience. Resilience is an, an interesting word that seems to pop up a great deal in studies of morale. Military discipline is certainly uh, in the eyes of the professional forces and of commanding officers and a central part of understanding and, and, and defining and raising morale. But as I find too, morale is a highly gendered notion and morale ultimately is determined, I suppose, by victory. But the part I'm trying to look at tonight centers on uh, a period in the war when Canadians are not in action, which I think is central part of how we understand the problem of morale. And I realized not long ago that morale is also a function of public relations. It's about trying to define a narrative for the Canadians, especially during this period in 1940 and 41, when the Canadians don't really have much of a role. So how does one, in effect, sell the Canadian army? And that's the problem that I'd like us to explore a little bit tonight. Now, the figure that I wanted us to start with is Charles Perry C.P. Stacy, who we consider the dean of Canadian military historians. 
And his story, I think, is wrapped up in this, because as much as we know that he's a University of Toronto, Oxford, Princeton graduate, it's clear that in the early going, especially as he just goes overseas in December of 1940, that's where we'll pick up the story, Stacy, uh, in, in effect, becomes a publicist for the Canadian Army. And that's something that we don't often think of when we refer to Stacy's uh, attempts to understand the Canadian war experience, the Canadian Army experience. When we think of someone who publicized the army, we think of that guy, a generation before Max Aitken, later Lord Beaverbrook, who of course will write a series of bestsellers, Canada and Flanders. Notice how the titles, these must be British and Canadian editions because they reverse the emphasis on either Borden or Bonar Law. Uh, but there's Canada and Flanders published in 1916, a great bestseller certainly seems to drive the narrative of how we under still drives the narrative of how we understand the Canadians in the First World War. So when Charles Stacy comes to Britain in December of 1940, he's a trained historian, but it's clear that in many respects, he and his masters, particularly Harry Kruger and Andrew McNaughton, are intent on presenting or in effect selling the Canadian Army and its most recent manifestation is the Second Canadian Corps, which becomes active on Christmas Eve, 1940, just as as Stacy is is landing uh, in Glasgow on Christmas morning. He sails up the Clyde, much to the relief of himself and the crew, and and it's clear that in that period, the Canadian Army is going to face some significant. And challenges that in part uh, McNaughton and Creerar will assign Stacy the job of publicizing the Canadian Army. And it's not going to be an easy sell. That's an image that's all familiar to us, and it strikes, it strikes me that it's a, a scene that Stacy himself would have understood. Stacy sets right to work as he comes in, takes the night train uh, on Boxing Day and manages to reach Canadian military headquarters just off of Trafalgar Square, where he meets the senior commanders and where he is immediately introduced to the kind of magnetism and vision that uh, Andy McNaughton is bringing to the problems of the Canadians overseas. And in his memoirs, he refers to how McNaughton immediately brings him into his confidence and speaks to him about the Visiting Forces Act and about our Canada's relationship with the British, who McNaughton, of course, will continue to uh, have difficulties with or challenges with. And so right from the get-go, Stacy is, you know, a 34-year-old Princeton graduate who's effectively been hired by Creerar, but who is, has been brought in, it seems, to not only write the history of the Canadian Army, and to write a series of historical reports, but to also then uh, understand something about how we're going to define the Canadian Army. Now, when he first starts, and these reports have been online for years and years, and I've always kind of looked at them, they're clearly first drafts for, Stacy's not yet the Army historian, but he's writing them for an effect himself. He doesn't know that yet. And they're really interesting kind of studies that many, much of it is excluded from the, from the final drafts, from the final volumes that he'll publish after the war. So they do give us some neat insights as to, as to what he's seeing. And, and one of the sites that he's seeing is that photograph. He's wandering through wartime London. He's seeing the Blitz. Uh, just days after he arrives, uh, one of the worst nights over London takes place the 29th and 30th, in which the Luftwaffe attacks. They know that the Thames tide level is low, so that the bombings take effect and the fire brigades have no water to put out the fires. So Stacy is describing these scenes taken from the high ground, I think near Kensington, and looking out over this sea of fires that are burning throughout the city. Some 1,500 homes and buildings were destroyed on that night alone. And Stacy's quite moved by it, as one could expect him to be. And he's amazed at the kind of uh, resilience, there's another word, that, that the Londoners are showing. They're 
amazed that John Gielgud is willing to put on his his latest play in the morning or the early afternoon to avoid the, the West End being under attack during theater time. He's, he's struck at the sort of way in which London is somehow coming out. And of course, you know, he, he is going near St. Paul's, a beautiful St. Paul's, which is saved. But it's clear that other churches, uh, he's a good Anglican, his father was an Anglican minister. So Stacey's quite moved by the destruction that he sees around him. Ancient churches, particularly near the Tower of London, are hit badly. So Stacey is, in many respects, quite struck by this sense of London, as, as so many of us have appreciated over the years, this resilience in the Blitz. Then we get closer to Matt. This is Canadian military headquarters in uh, uh, 1940 or, or thereabouts. And it, it's a great photograph in part because it, it helps start creating the narrative a little bit because it's clear that, that the bombs have not hit directly on CMHQ. It's the old, well, it's the Sun Life building right behind Canada House near Trafalgar Square. And CMHQ is hit. The windows have been knocked out. And Stacy, in one of his early drafts, describes CMHQ as a fortress. You know, they've reinforced the windows. They've put in an entrance way that's concrete and barbed wire. And and he and he very much sees this as as this attempt to show that the center of the Canadian military effort is itself under attack, and yet standing up and uh, and resisting uh, the, the interruptions brought by the Blitz. But it's also clear, too, that the news of the, of the new Canadian Corps prompts him to say, oh, my gosh, this is bringing us back to the legacy of the old Canadian Corps under Arthur Curry in the First World War. And he immediately writes in one of his earliest reports, this is early 1941 then, he writes the narrative that we're all so familiar with. It's amazing how much of it is intact, how much of it, I think, is in some ways drawn from, from Aitken's stories. And that is, you know, the story of the Canadians going overseas. And in eight months, they face the first gas attacks at Second Yeet. They uh, uh, defend the salient in April of 1915. And, and you could almost hear these words spilling out of them without any reference to anything else. It's part of the popular imagination. It's part of that narrative that we understand as early as 1939. We go to the Somme. We go to Vimy Ridge. We, you know, fight at Passchendaele. We're part of the 100 Days. And, and it's this legacy in, in the context of the, of, of the Canadian Corps that Stacy wants us to sort of remember. It, it becomes in many ways when we talk about morale it be, and the narrative, it's clear that that's the benchmark against which the Canadian operations a, gener a generation later will be me measured. The problem then is how do you discover them? How do you build the narrative for the second war? And so for him, the idea of this new Canadian Corps, this core organization to be led by General McNaughton, uh, not only harkens back to the CEF. He says, you know, this is this is a continuation of that military legacy that we had a generation before, but he's also, it's clear, trying in effect to sell the Canadian Corps, not only then to the veterans of the First World War to somehow suggest that continuity. But he's also trying, and this is clear in the correspondence between Creer R. McNaughton and, and also the things that Stacy will write, he's trying to sell it to a whole series of different audiences, not only Canadian veterans, but a wary public. Remember, it's, uh, um, Harold uh, Russell's just published a wonderful account of Norwood Park in the, in, uh, the, the latest issue of Waterloo Historical Society. I, I will sell it to you. No, I won't sell it to you because I haven't paid him for it yet. I've got to be careful. And now I'm kind of robbing Peter to pay Harold. The 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 issue here is is fascinating because you've got then, uh, as you mentioned, an army divided between conscripts for home defense, remember, and volunteers who go uh, in any theater is where they're called. And almost immediately do you realize that the Canadian Corps becomes a symbol of a certain number of things. One of them is you're going to have to convince Canadians, as well as the cabinet and perhaps even Mackenzie King, the prime minister, that as much as you've created a divided army with the power or with this 
question and the importance of home defense that that you have to show that the Canadian Corps' main mandate is an expeditionary force. And you're going to have to show that it's that it's going to be centered in England, that you're going to have to try to provide a means to, to uh, impart the idea that this war, as much as it's about the defense of Canada, that it's going to have to be centered in England and it's going to have to be centered, in effect, within the experience of London. So or in England as well. So what we begin to see quite early on in 1940 is a whole series of attempts by Stacy to sort of make sense of what's happening, particularly with the first division that first arrives in England in December of 1939. And as Stacy admits in, in six years of war, the Canadians don't get a very warm welcome. They're ending up in Aldershot, and they, uh, uh, which is long used to soldiers. The weather's bad. The food's worse. And Aldershot is a town of, of, it's an old garrison town since the Crimean War. So not too many people are there to welcome the Canadians. And there's a whole series of ways in which it appears as if Aldershot is not the favorite place for Canadians to be based. And so almost immediately do we know, and Stacy writes about this in one of his reports, is that film he realizes is going to have to be an important way of selling the army. And so as a result, uh, and I don't know the connection quite between Stacy himself and the National Film Board, but these films will be coming out of the National Film Board very early on in 1940. Remember, the NFB is only created in the fall of 1939 under John Grierson. And so these very short, very low budget films are being shown widely throughout the uh, uh, th widely throughout the country as shorts before the main feature. And uh, and this film shows up as early as July of 1940. And it's an attempt clearly to show that they know letters are coming home, as Stacy will admit in the fight in, in six years of war. People are writing home saying, this is terrible. Don't join the army, telling their younger son or brothers and so on to, not to join. So a letter from Aldershot, in part, I think, inspired by, by Stacy's attempts to, to understand and appreciate film for Canadian audiences, very much addresses some of the complaints that they're already hearing about Aldershot. So the, the film goes into great detail about how good the food is, about the camaraderie, about the level of training. The king and queen are coming out to Aldershot to inspect the troops. This is great stuff, right? And, and there are some right, quite touching kind of uh, attempts by, by people from all across Canada. Remember, First Division comes from all across Canada to, to try to have these, these almost radio messages back home, including Francophones, who are, uh, I think, a central part of the narrative as well for a variety of reasons. So almost from the beginning, do we see how this film, uh, these films, and there are a series of them, uh, are, are trying to convince people that the war is important, that the army is a welcoming institution, that morale can be kept up, and that uh, it, it is an attractive place because it's clear very early on that in the public mind, in the public eye, the army is a distant third to the Navy and the Air Force. And in part, that's because <laughs> army uniforms suck. <laughs> And, and marvelous stuff. And, and uh, Elizabeth Spence is a, a cop scholar working with me on this whole body of material that we've discovered. It's really quite fun. And, and one of the studies that we found uh, is, is a study of, and it's by Charles Humphreys, who was a famous psychologist out of Queens University. And he does a study in 1942 of, uh, of young high school women. And they ask them, the questionnaire is about whether or not you'll dance with an army guy. And they go, no. We don't like them. They don't. We don't like their boots. We don't like the cut of their outfits. We prefer dancing with Navy and Air Force people. It's it's, a, it's an amazingly big issue about how the uniforms are are a part of this. So you know, you're kind of figuring out this whole way in which, in some ways, the Army is becoming a kind of uh, uh, laboratory for a lot of emerging social scientists and social workers. And it's really quite fun to to, to see what what we're finding in this. But the narrative in 1940 ain't second year. And Stacy admits that. And in his early attempts to kind of create a narrative style, he refers to the events of 1940. 
in quite dramatic and, and perhaps frustrating terms. To carry on the theatrical metaphor, the Canadian role consisted mainly of waiting hopefully in the wings. And on the one occasion when the Canadians did actually manage to get onto the stage, the curtain was suddenly run down or run down before they could play the role for which they had been intended. Marvelous stuff. What's he talking about? Well, it's the early forays. It's the Canadians when the fall of, of Europe begins in the spring of 1940. It's clear that the Canadians don't really have this place in the narrative. You know, the Americans or Americans, what are the Americans doing? They're not there. The British are, you know, we'll see the whole narrative developing about the defense of Britain, the, the, the Battle of Britain, Dunkirk, and so on and so forth. You know, Christopher Nolan keeps reminding us of that stuff. But where are the Canadians? Well, Stacey's writing these early narratives, and this, as I say, isn't second ye. We're supposed to send a contingent to Norway, and just before they're embarked to Trondheim, the Canadians are departed and go back to Norway or go back to Eldershot. A couple of guys who have Norwegian background are sent along as translators, and Stacy kind of jokes the fact that he they understood. <laughs> They needed translators for the North English battalions, which they were then supporting. Then the question of Dunkirk. Clearly through the summer of 1940, Stacy is trying to put McNaughton into the central picture. McNaughton does in fact sail across to Dunkirk to try to assess the situation. And he encourages and, and tells the British cabinet that there's no point in sending any reinforcements. You, it's part of the evacuation that's gonna happen in the early summer. And then, you know, uh, through the summer of 1940, the Canadians are up in the Midlands. And I didn't realize this. Andrew Stewart, British historian, has written about this in a way I just discovered. And the, and the Canadians are in Oxford, they're in Oxfordshire. And, uh, uh, you know, settling into the estate near the Duke of Marlborough's, which is the old uh, Churchill family home, uh, Woodstock and so on. And, and I, I only saw this this week. Stuart talks about the war diaries from that period in which they're, they're, they're described in quite, quite dramatic terms because they're going to be the main active force in, in the case of a German invasion. And you really do have to wonder, the photographs are quite extraordinary of you know fellas sitting behind very small anti-tank weapons in a, in a farmer's field with ducks all around them. They're, they're practicing how to, dis, how, to, how to make Molotov cocktails. They're sitting with scientists throwing bottles of fuel and various things, trying to figure out the right formula for Molotov cocktails. This is in the summer of 1940 when they sit briefly in the British Midlands. And then finally, of course, in June does a, a brigade from, uh, one brigade actually from the first division uh, embarks on this curious journey uh, into Brittany and uh, was an attempt to try to make contact with the British, but they actually land on the day that Paris falls. Uh, they catch wind of the, of the imminent French surrender and the trains turn back. Some of them end up at Saint-Malo. Oh, some of them manage to make their way off to whatever ships are taking them back to dear old Aldershot. So the narrative at this stage is, is really tough. It's, it's as if we're sitting in the wings and in typical Canadian fashion, the Canadian Active Service Force, as it's then called, is derisively called the Canadians almost saw France. So, you know, there's not much of a narrative there. But Creerar, in his correspondence and in his connections to, to uh, Colonel Stacy or to Major Stacy, as he then was, uh, Creerar is a fascinating character. And we know we have a wonderful biography of Stacy by Paul Dixon, which I would highly recommend. I keep going back to it and realize that Paul's been talking about this stuff and it's a, a terrific book. But Creerar sets up CMHQ in London. And then in the spring or early summer of 1940, he becomes the chief of the general staff. And it's, he, and it's he who realizes that he has this political kind of juggling act to perform that, uh, you know, he says in Ottawa, everybody's going everywhere at once. They don't quite know what to do, where to put the resources. People are talking about home defense. And he says, the key for us is to show that, that our goal is to, to create an expeditionary force, that our war is not on the shores of Gas Bay, although it will be in 1942, it will be about the defense of Britain. And there's a whole debate really about what the Canadians, what role they're going to play. And that too becomes the subject of much debate. 
but it's clear that Creerar is turning to Stacy to help create a narrative, a, a narrative that will allow us to, uh, in effect, situate the Canadians within the broader challenge that the war then faces. And so to that end, again, going back to these films, this is perhaps the most famous uh, film from the Canada Carries On series. It's, it's uh, made in 1941, and it's also uh, the first Academy Award for a, a documentary. So it's quite famous that way. But Churchill's Island is, again, fascinating when one fits it into the chronology of what I'm talking about, because it's clear that, that this is about selling the idea to Canadian audiences that the main front is not Canada, it's, it's Britain. And it's about creating the narrative that in some ways Stacy saw when he's wandering the streets of London as early as late 1940, early 1941. It portrays this sense of, of the British uh, uh, calmness, you know, keep calm and carry on was never used, but in some ways it embodies that. It doesn't mention the Canadians in the film, but it does seem to show and try to convince Canadians that this is where we need to center our energies and center our focus. A fascinating film, which is available on uh, on the NFB website. Actually, it's free. It's it's you know very short, but it it does speak to these problems of how you're going to convince a wary public that the that we need to in effect see the front line, not here, but over across the way. And so, to that effect, Stacy is uh, a publicist. And so he will, uh, on McNaughton's urging, write a series of articles, or in fact, write an article in originally the Canadian Geographic magazine, but it's republished. And I guess I was kind of excited about it because I thought I'll never be able to find this thing. And suddenly there it was at the Western Library. And of course, I didn't bring it with me, but it, it was reprinted. It's glossy. It's filled with photographs. And it's an attempt to try to fit the new Canadian Corps within this broader narrative. It's supposed to convince the veterans that this is a continuation of Curry's old, old pals in the First World War. It's to convince Canadians that this is that going to be the center of our military focus, not just the defense of Canada. And I'm, in many ways, it's to convince a wary government, including Canadian, the Mackenzie King, that this is to be uh, the center of our focus. Creerar is, of course, going to create a bigger army than anyone had ever anticipated, certainly Mackenzie King. So to create the narrative, I suppose, uh, of, of defending Britain against attack, of, of using that as the model, I think it serves not only King's old Anglophilic sensibilities, but it also speaks to a great many Canadians of British background or elsewhere who see the war and, and Canada's role in the defense and of Great Britain. Andrew Stewart, again, this fellow I mentioned, uh, who's, who's written about the Canadians in Oxford in 1940, writes, the, uh, writes another article in Canadian Military History, which is a wonderful journal under the extraordinary editorship. That's me, but anyway. <laughs> Actually, Matthew Barrett is doing all the hard work, and, and Mike Bechtold was for many, many years the wonderful editor of it for uh, when Terry was uh, running the place. And and the Canadian Corps is, is fascinating. Now, here am I trying to brag about myself and I lost my point. Um, it'll come back to me. That's called a senior's moment. No, the new Canadian Corps is, is, is fascinating because of the problem of role, right? And the problem of role is what are the Canadians gonna do? And it's clear by 40 and 41 that there's increasing pressure now on people, uh, uh, on the government, not only then to create a Canadian Corps in England, but to find a role for it in, a, in an operational theater. And the only operational theater back then is what? Well, we're not quite at Dieppe. Where would it be another operational theater? I know you know. No, we're not there yet. This is 4041. Oh, oh my God. We got it. We got it. I, I've got to take it, of course. You guys got to take it. The, <laughs> the desert, North Africa. Thank you. All right. You get my book. 
I'll give it to you at the discount. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> because the, you know, the Anzacs are in, in, in North Africa, right? And, and the Australians are there and the uh, New Zealanders, that's the Anzacs, the British are there. And, and so there's a great deal of pressure on, Sta on well, not Stacy, but on Krirar to say, what are the Canadians going to do? We need to deploy them. It's not enough to let them sit in England. And, and, and from what I'm getting, uh, and Stuart's piece is, is fascinating on this, and I don't think he quite gets it, but I think what's happening is, is that Krirar at the time in 1940-41 is trying to create a big army, a bigger army than, than what we had originally anticipated, obviously, in 1939. And, and he knows Mackenzie King is wary of a big army because of the implications of conscription, First World War, and all that good stuff. So it seems to me as if the creation of the big army is contingent on the idea that the army is going to stay put for a while. And, and there are practical considerations. There really is no way for the Canadians and the second division is coming in 41, uh, you know, under the Canadian Corps. There's really no practical way for the Canadians to get to the desert in 1940 or 41 at that stage but it's clear that there's a great deal of pressure for for the canadians to do something you know so there are competing notions about where the canadians should be at this period and so stacy's volume here stacy's article i think is an attempt to try to frame the canadian corps in a variety of ways again in the ways that i'm describing but most importantly as, as, as showing that the canadian corps is going to grow in england it's going to defend england and it's also then going to become a means to get back onto the continent at some point in the future. And that, of course, lends itself to some, some neat public relations that McNaughton will be a part of. So the new Canadian Corps is this glossy, widespread, we don't know what reaction it would be, but I can at least assume that this document, this brochure, all sorts of glossy photographs, all sorts of pictures of the Canadians in action, all sorts of pictures, too, of the divisional commanders who look terribly old. Victor Odlum, you know, veteran of the First World War. George Perks, you know, is second division commander at that stage. This is before the great kind of purging, I suppose, of the senior leadership under uh, in 1942. But it's an intended to show that these are vigorous kinds of activities that the Canadians are going to play uh, an important role, but at some point in the future. And that's clearly a difficult sell, given the kind of not only strategic uncertainty, but also the political uncertainty of the time as well. And I'll mention that in a sec. Um, this becomes, up to the time, one of the worst tragedies for the Canadians uh, in April of 1941, when the SS Nerissa goes down. It's hit by uh, German U-boats. It goes down very quickly, and there's a considerable loss of life. And, and I've often thought it's fascinating to kind of think about, we don't talk about the Nerissa, but again, the stuff that uh, Elizabeth and I are looking at, these old surveys and things, one of the things that, that these thinkings will have the significance of, and they, they sit down later in the war and they say, we want the, the conscripts to become volunteers, right? We want them to join up and go active and go overseas. And one of the reasons why they, they ask, why don't you want to go overseas? And a lot of them say, I'm scared to death of going across the Atlantic Ocean. And given the battle of the Atlantic that's waging and, and uh, given the loss that everyone have known of, of the Nerissa, probably makes a great deal of sense to understand something about the perils that they were facing as, uh, as, as, the, as the war continued in effect to cross the Atlantic for the Canadians. There is also in the correspondence between Creerar and McNaughton a growing concern about political criticism in Canada. And, and in fact, he's quite pointed. He doesn't mention him by name, but it's easy to figure out who he is. And he says, you know, there's somebody writing and there's somebody speaking who's causing us all kinds of mischief. And it didn't take me long to figure out who that was. It's this guy, George Drew, good old Colonel Drew former mayor of Guelph, Ontario. Can you imagine? He's at that point the opposition leader in Ontario. He's a good conservative. And he's a real bugger because he begins a series of, of speeches through the summer of 1941 uh, and the summer of 1940 
well, no, sorry, the summer of 1941 and the Globe and Mail, uh, you know, a very anti, not a, a supporter of Mackenzie King by any stretch, begins to publish a series of articles that are supposedly written by George Drew, but I think they're being ghostwritten. And, and the articles are amazing. And they're all called The War Problems Affecting Canada. And I don't want to compare George Drew to Donald Trump, <laughs> but I think I will, you know? He's being a real prick. Yeah, and, and I mean that in a nice way. He's he's attacking what he's attacking, and this is what drives Creer on nuts, is that Creer are kind of revamps the whole training system. And Harold talks about number 10 basic training center in Kitchener at Knollwood Park. Well, there are dozens of those basic and advanced training centers to try to de or to centralize army training. And that's what Creer does through 1940 and 41. So, and Creer are in fact, you know, that's his baby. And, and he also goes out and Creer himself is general chief of the general staff and he says, I want recruits. And in the spring of 1941, he gets them. He gets more than he asked for. Tens of thousands of young guys are joining up in, in the spring of 1941. So he's really bad at, at our friend George Drew because he's writing and making these vague kinds of, of statements that are attacking the, uh, the training establishments, the way in which the Canadians are being trained, the way in which they're being led, and the way in which they're anticipating the war. In some ways, you almost think he's a little sympathetic to the Germans, because, of course, the Germans are doing pretty well at this stage. But I love this phrase, for instance. So two military demonstrations, uh, which attracted considerable uh, attention in Toronto. First Canadian Armored Division is, is emerging and parading through the streets. And then you've got Third Division on the Atlantic coast. The very fact that the movements of these small forces could attract so much attention is the best possible evidence of the pitiful inadequacy of our present day training program. I don't follow the logic of that. I get it as a political statement, but it's clear that he is very much trying to undermine the whole, whole system that Ralston, that King, and ultimately that Creer have, have devised in 1941. And these articles go on through much of the summer. There's, there's really quite a score of them. And they're all terribly vague. And they're all terribly unrealistic because they say things like, well, we should be doing it more like the Americans. Mass troops, you know? We should have massive operational training uh, across these wide swaths. And you're thinking, what world are you living in? I mean, where, where is this going to happen, you know? And, he, and, it, it's, it, and, and then, of course, he makes disparaging comments or, you know, of the Canadians saying, oh, the, the German paratroopers who've landed in Crete in May show us that we need to, you know, deploy parachutists in ever greater numbers. In fact, we do. We put a, two battalions of parachuters together, parachutists, but it's an extraordinary kind of grab bag of political criticism kind of couched in, in, in military ease. I, I really don't think he wrote these things, but it's clear that these are gaining some popularity, I suppose, which perhaps further reinforces the narrative that Stacy is going to help create with the uh, under the guidance of McNaughton and Creerar. Then, of course, if we're talking about morale, I suppose when you are in uh, formation and your political leader comes to speak to you and you start to boo, Morale is probably at a bad level. And in August of 1941, this is a famous incident. You've probably heard about it. Mackenzie King, there he is in the center. Uh, this is a picture taken after the booing. So he's looking quite wary, I think. Mackenzie King always had a difficult relationship with the military. He doesn't trust them and he will continue not to. But uh, in, it's clear that he's uh, touring the uh, various installations as the uh, British are, or the Canadians are in Aldershot. And there, a whole bunch of guys start booing him. And boy, talk about embarrassing. And you can follow the kind of, there's me not in getting reports, there's Creer getting reports. And they send Stacy out to try to kind of account for what has happened. And he wasn't there, but he's interviewing people. And it's, it's clearly a, a just a, a cringy episode all around, you know? But it does speak again to perhaps uh, the, the, the unpop. I, I think it doesn't speak to the kinds of criticisms that Drew is raising, but it does raise the criticisms that the army isn't doing anything. You know, First Division has been there for well over a year and a half. And, and they are, in this case, they're, he's, he's inspecting the Red Hill Bypass, which the Canadian engineers have built around this city near London 
And it's a great event, I suppose, but it doesn't seem to be doing what the Canadians are supposed to be doing. So there it is, and it's a neat picture. Harry Salmon, of course, uh, who will suppose supposed to be taking first division to Italy, is of course killed in 1943. And this is a bad caption, but it comes from Wikipedia. So I get, what am I looking at Wikipedia? I'm sorry. Uh, it, and it refers to Governor General Georges Vanier. Well, he's not quite Governor General yet. Uh, he's a he's a diplomat at that stage. So anyway, uh, but I do love the expression on on Mackenzie King's face. You know, here he is, and, and, and Stacy actually, who despises King after the war, writes a terrible biography of him based on his diaries. Nevertheless, I think he's feeling almost empathetic. You know, you can see him almost tensing up as he's waiting to be booed again by the troops as we go. So September of 1941, again, all kinds of setbacks. Uh, uh, and, and it's in large measure in that visit when King is overseas that this issue about deploying the Canadian Corps is really coming to a uh, to a head. And King himself is trying to make statements that are in some ways fairly well accepted, that we are going to defend England in 1941. But it's, it's Churchill, in fact, at a luncheon that he hosts Mackenzie King at Mansion House, the center of the Lord Mayor of London. It's Churchill, of course, and all his eloquence who's going to make the best defense of the Canadians who are going to be staying in England or in, in defending England. And I won't do my best church, my, or my worst Churchillian accent, but the Canadians have not had a chance of coming cl to close quarters with the enemy. It is not their fault. It is not their fault. But there they stand and there they have stood through the whole of the critical period of the last 15 months at the very point where they would be the first to be hurled into a counterstroke against an invader. No greater service can be rendered to this country. No more important military duty can be performed by any troops among all the allies. Marvelous kind of Churchillian statement defending the Canadian uh, position in Britain, defending it. Brilliant stuff. And of course, the back page of this booklet that I'm showing you, or at least I'm telling you about because I forgot it, of course, shows that marvelous picture, that picture of Churchill and McNaughton elbow to elbow, pouring over the maps, you know? This is marvelous publicity in 1941. It defines the fact that Canadians are defending, that Canadians are a central part of the planning, it seems. They probably weren't, but there you are. And there's, you know, McNaughton with his spectacles, ever the engineer, pouring over the maps, showing Churchill uh, operational issues and so on and so forth. It's a, it's a marvelous statement of, of what we are to expect, I suppose. And it's also in September of 1941 that, that the, the press sit down with McNaughton and McNaughton makes that key phrase again that we often will refer to do I have it here? Sorry. Yeah. This is the front mag front page of, of McLean's in at the end of 1941, a special army number. But it's back in um, um, September when Churchill's making the Mansion House speech that McNaughton makes a key phrase. It's a marvelous phrase that we all kind of echo. It's great. He says, you know, there will have to be an invasion of the continent. I don't think you can bring a proud and well-organized nation to her knees with missiles alone. The Canadian Corps is a dagger pointed at the heart of Berlin. Make no mistake about this. A dagger pointed at the heart of Berlin. Marvelous phrase that still kind of resonates, but at the time, it's one of those marvelous PR phrases that speaks to both, you know, ambition, resilience, but we don't know when that dagger is going to make its mark. It's a, it's a great exercise in public relations, I suppose, that, that to me reflects the great dilemmas that the Canadians under McNaughton and that Stacy himself has to play a central role in. I'm doing pretty good. All right, all right, that's good. He told me that morale drops after 750, you know, so I gotta be wary of that. We're going to do a, a force march in an hour. So, you know, you guys get your coats on and make sure you're ready. So I'll, I'll mention this briefly and then we'll conclude. 
Uh, again, uh, Stacy has nothing to do with Maclean's magazine, but it is at, at the time one of the biggest English language magazines uh, published throughout the uh, the Dominion. And it again, it's 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 interesting to see how this is the first time that McNaughton gets on the cover. There have been covers for the Navy. There have been covers for the Air Force. There hasn't been a cover yet for the Army. December forty one. And so it appears as if Army public relations, the Army information, is starting to catch. Uh, a sense of what it's required in order to sell the Canadian army to a, a public, to the troops, uh, given its lack of a role, is in fact a vital role, according to Winston Churchill. So a series of articles here, which are really fun, by well-known uh, journalists, Wallace Rayburn is, is you know, riding along in the tanks that have just been brought over. Uh, uh, one of the Chatelaine columnists is writing about the quality of the food. You know, this is good stuff. A generation ago, we didn't have vegetables and fruit. Now, you know, people are talking about nutrition in the Canadian army. Can you imagine? So there are all kinds of ways in which this, it appears to be a way of, of in effect, reviving or defining the narrative of the Canadian core uh, as a as a kind of representation, a di different representation than its forebears had. It's worth note noting as a final remark that the next issue of Maclean's is I think the fifteenth of December. And whose uh, whose articles are in it but George Drew's, and he's oh he's a sneaky guy, because he's still like the provincial leader of the Tories. He's going to become provincial premier in forty three. He becomes the federal uh, conservative leader after the war, but never makes it. Uh, um, and of course, John Diefenbaker takes over in 57. But George Drew is pretending that he's prime minister material. It's marvelous because the photographs and his criticisms of the Canadians continue in McLean's magazine. Uh, and there's a, a great picture of him standing outside 10 Downing Street. And I think why is Churchill spending his time with the provincial leader of, of Ontario or the opposition leader of Ontario? But nevertheless, the, the whole thing seems to suggest that there are a variety of political pressures that the Canadian army is facing in late 1941. Um, so in that sense, we'll end our story there and I'll jump to the end of my notes and actually read them for a change. So Charles Stacy arrived overseas at a critical time. He understood army morale and the work of the auxiliary service officers, and then the efforts to keep lonely men fed, healthy, well-trained, and entertained. Stacy also recognized that morale was linked closely to presenting a clear wartime narrative. More than historians have previously acknowledged, Stacy took an active role in the army's public relations overseas. He detailed how the Canadians remained in the wings through 1940 as a remarkable drama unfolded around them. The challenge in 41 was to sell the new Canadian Corps. Even as it took up a relatively passive role to defend England, it had to be the successor to a legendary formation and the spearhead of Canada's expanded war effort. Public and political opinion mattered a great deal at this time. And so for many, and, and for many were convinced that army officials were not doing enough. A series of short NFB films may have helped, as did Stacy's own writings. General McNaughton's famous reference to the army as a dagger pointed at the heart of Berlin was, a, in my view, a public relations coup. The challenge of army morale would only worsen when the war, with the war news to come. Thank you very much. Well, Jeff, thanks so much for a, a terrific talk. It's so much fun to kind of listen and hear the new things that you've been working on over the last little while. Uh, you know, we've checked in every year, it seems, yeah, to see yeah. what's happening. I liked when you said the book's coming in the near future. <laughs> My book is a dagger pointed at the heart of a publisher. Something like that. <laughs> Has a similar kind of tone. <laughs> Um, so as we always do, we're going to uh, turn to the Q&A, but we're going to alternate between the audience here in the room and those that are on Zoom uh, tuning in from, from home. Um, I'll start things off with a question on Zoom. And for those who are asking questions on Zoom, please do let us know where you're coming from. It's always just 
fun to know if folks are tuning in locally or from afar. Um, but I'll start first with a question um, on Zoom, and then we'll turn things over to folks here in the in the room for questions. Um, so the first question, Jeff, uh, comes to you from uh, Robert De Broyle, and he asks if you could speak to the role that the home front played in troops morale. Um, I guess during 41, but also beyond throughout the rest of the war. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that uh, morale is the connection between the home front and the troops overseas is enormous. And I, I introduced my course the other night and I showed them the famous picture of the little boy and, the, and we know it is wait for me, daddy. And it's the little five-year-old boy who breaks from his mother's embrace and grabs his father. Oh, I always, I hate that picture. It makes me weep. Anyway, but what's fascinating about that photograph, and they've commemorated it now, I think in 2014, there's a memorial in, in New Westminster, BC, is, is that it, it shows uh, the, the big problem in the Canadian army is separation. And in Canada, 1942, we're still looking over all this stuff, Elizabeth and I, and um, uh, the army surveys the troops in Canada. And they say, there's a terrible morale problem here. And in part, it's because two thirds of those, and these are the guys in Canada, are desperately worried about their families. And the army is, is slowly trying to come to terms with that. So the importance of man becomes crucial, you know? By the time we get to Italy, Ralston has ordered airmail to make sure the, air, the, the, the mail is getting through. And then there's a whole series of, of elements that are fascinating too, because we do set up a directorate in 1942. I'll talk about this perhaps at another time. The Directorate of Special Services, which is supposed to deal with the problem of army morale. And Will Pratt at West has looked at this too in his graduate work and, and others. Uh, the problem that they're facing, they say in 1942, is not so much that the mail isn't getting through, it's that the mail is of the wrong kind. And, and ministers and padres overseas are saying, too many of my guys are getting Dear John letters. They're getting letters from their wives and girlfriends and mothers that are telling them how miserable they are. <laughs> and so, so they don't quite know what to do with this. So they decide to create a, uh, a program through the newspapers, perhaps in McLean's, of encouraging women. Because, of course, this is a, a gendered problem. Those darn women, you know, they can't. And, and what they're trying to encourage the women to do is write friendly letters. The Friendly Letters Campaign. So, you know, that interaction between the, the home front and uh, particularly women and the men overseas is huge. And I should say, as a sad footnote, you know, the, it's the Bernard family that's photographed in New Westminster. It's a famous shot that's printed all over the world. And of course, the little boy, Whitey Bernard, meets his dad in 1946, and his parents divorce soon after. So, you know, it speaks to these long separations that the army is trying to deal with. And, and it's a problem they never fully overcome. Um, is there any questions here in the room for Jeff? And before I, I turn, you, you can go first, but we're going to give you a microphone just so folks on Zoom can, can hear the question. Nice shirt, Emily. Thanks. <laughs> Jeff. Um... After Dieppe, uh, I would think that morale would probably be at the all-time low. How was the, did the military explain that to Canadians? How did the papers in Canada explain it to Canadians? And how did the military explain it to the troops over in, in, uh, in England? Good question. Morale is not low after Dieppe. It isn't. Uh, I, I'm I'm struggling with this, and this is where I, the film stuff is so interesting because the national or the there were two sets of films, one for the NFB, one for the Army, and the Army starts putting out Army uh, film and photo newsreels in October of '42, and so the first one, and these are 
almost like the Pathé News. There'd be short little clips that would be connected together. And, and, and in the first clip, which is now on YouTube, they're all digitized and downloaded. Uh, you know, they're showing the kind of standard stuff with troops deploying and generals shaking hands. And then they catch word, it's clear that, that the Dieppe survivors are, are going to Buckingham Palace to get their medals and decorations. And it's a really fascinating thing in which the narrators try to keep up with all the clips and all the shots of these various people coming out of Buckingham Palace and Porteous with his VC and and DCMs all around and military medals. And, and he's trying desperately, you could tell, trying to write it all down. Um, within the context of 1942, Dieppe, and, and there's no doubt that Dieppe is costly, but people know it fairly early. The, no one's holding back the, the numbers of casualties that are being published in newspapers. Uh, within the context of 1942, it's, it's like, let's get on with it. Now, that's per perhaps different in Windsor or in Hamilton, uh, where some of these units were, or Toronto, you know, where the Royal uh, Regiment suffered so badly of Puy. But in 1942, uh, people are, wa and may maybe this comes out of the whole narrative, right? People want action. And by 1942, the Canadian Corps or the Canadian Army headquarters is existing. And and we still have yet to see action. So I'm not saying that that's the real reason, but at least it seems to suggest that it satisfies uh, a group within Canada who want to see Canadians in action. And, and again, I keep looking for the signs of shrinking morale after Dieppe, and I don't see them. Yeah, so I might be proven wrong, but we'll keep looking for the Dieppe survey stuff. And it's amazing how that doesn't seem to be the case. Thanks, Hardy. Um, Jeff, you, you mentioned Will Pratt earlier um, in your talk, and there's a question coming from Pat Dennis, who's tuning in locally, um, about what Will calls the um, medicaliz medicalization of morale. Um, and Pat's specific question is whether health becomes an effective measure of an army's morale whether in the sense of the health, the physical health of the army, or in this idea of malingering or feigning illness. Right, right. Uh, hello, Pat. Um, it's a neat question because uh, it's clear that when the director of special services is created, there's, to me, a kind of an interesting conflict between the public relations people and the psychologists. And they both have different perspectives on how to deal with, how to define, how to raise morale. Eventually, it, it seems like the social scientist guys win. And these surveys that they start creating are the things that we're looking for. Um, Ed Webster was a, a early industrial psychologist at McGill who works as one of these people. And at one point in 1943, he writes a kind of nice summary of the progress that this particular directorate has made. And he says, initially, we've come up with what we thought was a formula for measuring morale. And he says it's a function of health and discipline. And so every month, units had to write out and fill out a unit morale report, which said, OK, how many of you uh, have faced how many AWOL in your unit? How many have been brought before the commanding officer? How many court marshals? How many in prison? Blah, blah, blah. And how many have VD? And, and for the longest time, I thought, wow, they've really come up with an interesting measure here. They're quantifying morale on the basis of these measures. And then Ed Webster writes in 1943, he said, yeah, we thought that worked. And it doesn't. He says... We realized that our that we were stretching the evidence that there were spur, you know, that the that the causation wasn't there, that there were other reasons, that rates of, you know, AWOL had far more to do with how far away your unit was from your family. And so if you tried to get leave and you couldn't make it, you went AWOL to try to get back. So so it's it's neat to kind of get a sense in the army of how they're trying to quantify 
and and they realize that at least it, that particular measure doesn't work as well as they thought. So they they start taking a different approach. Um, kind of keeping on the lines of medicine, um, there's a question from Roger Fournier. Um, you know, I, I certainly see this during the First World War. Um, yeah. But as soldiers are kind of, you know, moving from casualty clearing stations, uh, from hospitals, and then back to the front lines after they have been, um, you know, they've undergone their, their weeks of recovery is the sight or seeing these men returning to the front lines, um, perhaps prematurely because of, um, you know, manpower issues or anything like that? Are you noticing at any point in the war that that's becoming an issue for morale of soldiers seeing men returning to the front lines perhaps earlier than they think they might be or should be? The other way they're measuring morale overseas is by reading their letters. And so you've got a whole bunch of university trained officers who are sitting in the safety of some vast place and they pull bags of mail off the, off the mail bags before they're going out. And they start writing to, twice a month, these reports based on hundreds, thousands of letters. And they're also trying to quantify those. But you, and to me, these are gold mines because they speak to all the issues that they see as important, you know, and and I guess I, I don't think it gets granular enough, at least from those kinds of reports, to get down to that kind of, of stuff. Now, it would obviously depend on time and place. I don't, I think I went to the archives the last time and got the wrong 1945 stuff. Um, so I, I don't have that. But it, it, it may well be at certain places at certain times where you might have that. Um, you do get a good talk just to kind of answer a different question of when this when the so-called zombies first come those are the conscripts who are not volunteering and who've been sent over in after november of 1944 and there you see uh you know you're waiting because there's a growing anger about the zombies everybody's writing about the zombies and how yellow they are and and you know Yellow is not racist. It's a reference to them being un, not brave, cowardly. And then they're saying, you know, all oh, these guys, if I see one of those guys, you know, and then all of a sudden you read the letters and they're going, some of these guys aren't too bad. Early 45. Like, it's like, bring them in. You know, we're short of, short of guys. We're not quite sure. And he says, some of them are well-trained. We don't like their attitude. We don't like the fact that they had to be conscripted. But, but it's fascinating to see the morale reports kind of saying, well, these guys perhaps aren't as bad. So that's another way of answering the question that touches, but I haven't seen the, the specific issues about, about return wounded fellows. That, that becomes a different issue. And I just haven't seen that in the record. Yeah, question here. I'll pass the mic to you. Thanks, Emma. Um, I don't actually have a question, but I can respond to a little bit of that with my own dad who was um, injured, had a terrible head injury from his Jeep blowing up in Italy oh. and almost died. And um, they sent him to um, for medical help. And he was eligible to be shipped home because his injury was so bad. And he said, no way. I want to get back to my comrades. Wow. I am going back. You know, you're not sending me back. And the doctor said, well, Okay, I'll put you on lab work for a while and see if you change your mind. No way. Get me back. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? So, yeah. you know, there was there was morale among those yeah. guys for sure. Yeah, no, that's, you know, that's and a really I'm good sure point. that was very inspiring for the guys that they went back to. Yeah. Yeah. You can see no, this is really good because it it it's well, it speaks to your father. It's a good thing that he came back. Uh, but it also speaks to the fact that you can see they do separate morale reports in hospitals. And, and they're really amazed at the high level of morale in hospitals. Now, some of them are so badly wounded, they are going to go back, but they're like, ah, you know, we're in it to the end. But you see, there's quite a number of, and again, how one measures this stuff is really tricky, but you can see it, it was enough, significant enough that they would make it a subject line in their reports. Mm -hmm. And they would say, yeah, there are a lot of guys who want to get back to the unit. They hate it 
if they're not sent back to their own unit, mm. right? That becomes a real issue. Mm -hmm. But that, and, and again, it's amazing about the Canadian Army. It, it grows so big beyond its regimental roots, but the regimental identity still, yeah. especially for people like your father, uh, was a huge element. They want to get back to the unit. They want to get back with the lads. Yeah, and uh, and and that's certainly a that's an issue that you can see as as they're trying to deal with the issue that you're talking about, you know, of, mm -hmm. of what you do with with the fellas that are wounded or hurt. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, thanks for that. That's a great comment. Uh, Alex, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, give me a second. <laughs> You're getting your 10,000 steps, Emily. Great talk, Jeff, as always. Um, my question is, for, from a historical writing perspective, as you work on this book uh, that's pointed at the heart of a publisher somewhere, um, you have a lot of different feedback loops going on here. You've already discussed them. There's the political side of things. There's what the individual soldiers are feeling based on their experiences and how the army is then reacting to that to try to improve morale or do whatever they want to do with that narrative you're talking about. So how does one go about organizing all those thoughts? Are you thinking of doing something chronologically or maybe something thematically in the book you're maybe starting to think about? Yeah, next question. <laughs> um, it's the great problem as you know, as Mike knows, as Eric knows, you know, Brittany, anyone writing a big project like this has to make editorial choices about theme and chronology. And, and I guess just the nature of morale makes me want to go towards the thematic. But I'm always mindful of the fact that I'm trying to tell a story as it develops through the war. So it, uh, I've written about 30, 40 pages of introduction and I'm still not any further ahead than I thought I would be for the very problem, for the very reason that you're raising, just to try to figure out how to, um, uh, you know, reconcile. And I, and I guess what I've done though, and I guess I did it a little bit. I, I liked how I ended up doing it in the career art book um, was the idea that you could, you could tell the thematically, tell it thematically up to a point when you see what the army's doing to try to deal with morale and then jump to chronology once you get into Italy and once you get into Northwest Europe. So I, it, it's like, uh, you know, how does the institution deal with morale? And then how are the, how does one understand the, the theater operations when you, when you impose the morale idea on it? And I think that's, that's how it's working for me. Uh, um, everybody likes to talk about crises of morale. That, that becomes, historians love to talk about crises of masculinity and crises of morale and everything else. And the guy who kind of started me on this stuff is Jonathan Fennell. He's a very nice guy. Uh, but I disagree. I, yeah, I disagree with what he, some of what he's done because I'm a Canadian and I don't think he gives it the Canadian. I don't, I, to me, because one of the things about morale is that it's a Canadian narrative. And I think that wonderful book that he wrote on the People's War, it's still a British Army history. You have to be careful. Hi, Jonathan, if you're watching, you probably are. It's after midnight over there. But anyway, it... it so it's that problem of trying to kind of underline that. And uh, and to me, as far as the, they always make the assumption that the crisis in morale is in Normandy. I don't think it's, I, and it is to some degree, but it, it vanishes quickly. The big crisis in morale to me is 1942, uh, when, when the army's kind of coming together and so many people are worried about public impressions of the army, particularly because of its lack of role. And the big crisis of morale um, is in 1945, after the war is over. And, uh, you know, they got nothing to do. And, and they're welcome. They're welcome very generously by the Dutch in large measure where their forces are concentrated. But they want to get the hell home. 
and and once that whole broader purpose is gone for them oh things get nasty and so that to me is is sort of the way in which i'm trying to construct a narrative so i talk it through with you i might you and i might have to chat again you know but it is it's the great problem of trying to figure out how to bring it all together yeah that, that's interesting the crisis point comes after the war then not so much during the war in morale yeah yeah i if we were to call it a crisis yeah well you know well it is a crisis actually yeah uh canadians have their trouble in utrecht in the september of 45 repatriation is going badly and then suddenly the ships appear and uh it's like oh okay and, and again the accounts are fascinating because the 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 censors who are reading the mail go wow i've never seen morale this bad you know because it's people going i'm wanting to get home mm -hmm. and then suddenly the ships appear and uh you know the queen elizabeth is suddenly available for the canadians bonus <laughs> get them out of town yeah. it's, it's fascinating that way um there's a number of questions about the surveys you've alluded to them you and elizabeth have been working on them um i'll let elizabeth answer these questions <laughs> <laughs> Um, could you just give us some more kind of detail about the surveys themselves? You know, when were they first created? Who were they created by? What was their purpose? And were they effective at measuring morale? Yeah. Um, the first one I came across was this big one in 1942. And it was created by Ed Webster and Sam Bois, who were both recent grads in psychology from McGill University. And they have a private company. They're, they're commissioned by Brock Chisholm, another fascinating figure in the life of the Canadian army. And it's about morale. And, and it's there that they survey several thousand, eight, six or 7,000 um, uh, troops. And, and the results are in many ways, as I say, suggesting a real morale crisis. Um, this, the, the survey is intended to create or to justify the creation of this directorate of special services. And Sam Bois, who's a former Catholic priest, actually, who becomes a psychologist, starts, he and Ed Webster start to, uh, um, in effect, do surveys for any branch of the service. So they're just, it's, it's like a catch-all. They're going to put together this stuff. And, and, and from my measure, uh, there's about 200 of them. And, and they burn them. But they digitize them and they didn't give us an index. Mm -hmm. So Elizabeth and I are, and then we, yeah, there's a long story there, but I mean, it is a matter of just pouring through some of the Canadiana online files and suddenly, wow, like there's there's this marvelous survey on something that you wouldn't possibly imagine that they would be interested in, but there it is. So, you know, again, it shows you how morale kind of permeates the uh, the nature of the army. And it's, again, a remarkable reflection on the way in which the army is trying to address these issues that, that they're uh, concerned about. They're drawing from the American model, less so the British. So that, too, is a kind of neat little element of our discussion, too. I think we probably have time for one or two more questions. And I want to turn it over to the room uh, if there is another question from someone here that they would like to ask Jeff. I, I see flagging yeah. morale. <laughs> Morals? Oh, no. Well, for you, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. How much of uh, Stacy's, can I say, puff pieces for the public, filtered down to the soldiers, and how would they see them? Would it just be PR BS, or would it be something that might actually help their morale? Yeah. Uh, I, I think the, the second Canadian Corps pamphlet uh, is geared towards a Canadian audience. I don't think, I mean, so you've got lots of troops in Canada too. Uh, so the troops in, in, in Britain may or may not have seen that. It's always hard to know when, I mean, you've looked at newspapers far more than anyone else in the room. It'd be great to think that everything that we read is something that then somebody understood to happen. But we don't know that as to whether or not people read it, understood it, agreed with it, or so on. So this may well have been a, a slick, limited run 
brochure. Now, many people were reading Canadian Geographic Journal in 1941. I still can't find the original copy, but it was clearly something that McNaughton liked and then had it republished in glossy form. I don't know how many. I've never seen any other reaction to it. So, I, you know, I mean, it would be fun to know if it actually worked. And I guess I'm not as much interested. It would be nice to know if it was. I guess I'm just fascinated by the fact that the army had to be sold in a way that spoke to a whole set of different audiences. And this was a puff piece, certainly, but it, it, it's trying to kind of address what is clearly the problem of the army in 1940-41. Thanks, Rich. Yes. Um, you spoke about the low morale uh, after 1945 when the war was over, but uh, quite a number of uh, army personnel signed up for the Army of Occupation. And uh, one individual I knew uh, went in uh, the day after D-Day and went through the whole thing up through Holland and all the wow. rest of it into Germany. And he signed up for the Army Occupation. I think he stayed about two more years. Uh, so would you know what percentage, like I presume all the Army of Occup Occupation was taken from the people that were already over there? And yes. would you have any idea what percentage uh, that would make up of the initial two corps that were sent over? Uh, I think the Army of Occupation, from the Canadian perspective, is about 25,000. So a, a good, healthy divisional strength. Um, and uh, so, you know, the, the motivation of the gentleman that you know, wow. I mean, it's it's amazing to think of the kind of <laughs> Talk about resilience, I suppose. There's there's a great sense of, of morale for him to see the job through. There is, uh, one of the things that's fascinating too is the degree to which the government is clearly, especially over the conscription crisis, looking at the morale reports and, and making policy in response to it. So it's no coincidence that when conscription is imposed in November of 1945. It's also the point when the government says, you won't have to go to Japan because the morale report since 43 are saying, no one wants to go to Japan. Now, all of a sudden in the summer of 45, 36,000 people sign up for, the, for Japan. And the reason is that they're trying to jump the queue. Because the government says, again, morale's low, everybody wants to get home, but they say we'll give first priority, first spot on the boats to the guys who are gonna go to Japan, and we'll give you one month's leave before you have to leave for the Pacific. And everyone's going, that sounds pretty good. Let's hope the war ends in the Pacific. And guess what? All so 36,000 people, after everyone says nobody wants to go to Japan, they offer a pretty sweet deal. And of course, their bet pays off because the war is over before they have to go. So whatever motivates people may well just be a way of finding a, a way to a loophole, as it were. But, uh, but your individual, wow, remarkable that way. Yeah. Um. I'm going to ask the last question to you, Jeff, um, and then we'll wrap things up. Um, you started with Ukraine, Russia-Ukraine war. Um, let's return to it. Um, hmm. Are there any lessons from the research you've done so far that you think would be pertinent for you know those observing, um, reading about the Ukraine-Russia war, um, kind of indications of morale, low morale, high morale points, crises in morale? Um, what sort of, what lessons could we draw when we're observing the war that's going on in the in Russia Ukraine? And if there are no lessons, oh. that is okay too. Yeah, because yeah. I think the thing is, like as historians, sometimes we can overstep our bounds and we prognosticate and we make we talk about things that we don't have the expertise in. And so I think it's never stopped me. 
Yeah. <laughs> and I saw it in the pandemic constantly, but I remember there was one op-ed in the op in the Globe and Mail where one historian just said like, there is no good comparison here. This is truly unique and we need to treat it as such. What, the pandemic? The pandemic, yeah. Comparing oh, to past pandemics. There's a good book on it by Mark Humphreys. Yeah, yeah. It happens a hundred years ago. Well, let me take a stab. I, I, I guess, you know, I'm sympathetic to Ukraine. I think Putin is an evil bastard. And uh, I think he overstepped himself in a, in a curious way uh, and completely underestimated. Putin actually, before the war, was doing public opinion surveys in Ukraine. And, and in part, you know, he was trying to measure the sense of the Ukrainian mood. And, um, and everyone who took the survey who complained about corruption, complained about Zelensky, complained about their life. And, and in part, they think those surveys were what motivated Putin to launch the attack that he did. He got it wrong, you know? Um, and I, so I think that, that, you know, narrative is important to the Ukraines. It's an existential crisis. And, uh, and, you know, there's any number of ways in which that narrative can be painted, uh, but it's about the defense of Ukraine. It's about the defense of, a, of an autonomous country uh, that really voted to separate itself from the Soviet Republic in 1991, has lived relatively prosperously in that time since. And, and it's, you know, there's always been a strong sense of Ukrainian nationalism in large part because of its hostility to the Soviets. Um, I'll mispronounce it, but, you know, the Ukrainians have a deep sense of history and they hate the Soviets. They hate the Russians. And if you read anything about, I'm going to mispronounce this, a Halimador, in which Stalin tried to kill by starvation, 4 million Ukrainians in the early 1930s, that's something that is known by every Ukrainian. You know, so for them, history is simple. It's it's another attempt by Putin to destroy Ukraine. Um, and, in, and when framed in those terms, which I think are fairly simple, but I think are obvious, uh, Ukrainian um, uh, morale, if if that's the right word, is is going to stand up against him. How that how the war ends, I have no idea, and and it's obviously contingent on American and Western support which may or may not be solid in this year. So, but narrative is important and, and, his, and we draw upon, I mean, just as we were trying to create a narrative about the second Canadian Corps, bad example, but in some ways it's true. You're trying to link the legacy of the first Canadian Corps to the second Canadian Corps, even though the second Canadian Corps ain't doing anything in much the same way as what happened to their fathers. That's a hugely important way in which you instill a story, a justification for what the war is about. I think that's the same case in, in Ukraine. I think that's a great way to start or to end tonight. Um, it speaks to how powerful history is, the writing of history and the experience of history. Um, I think sometimes we forget that, but especially over the last several years, I think we've shown how powerful the forces of history really can be in very tangible and oftentimes brutal ways. Um, but let's give Jeff one more round of applause for an excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank now, you for coming out. Now, before I, I let you all go, uh, I just <laughs> want to say a few more things. I'm talking I... the hot now. <laughs> before I release you all back into the deep freeze. Um, we do have a few books to sell at the back of the room. Um, so for those who are interested in buying copies, not of Creer's Left Tenants here in the room, um, there's two books available for sale. For those who would like a copy of Creer's Left Tenants, we do have it available online for you to purchase and it will be shipped to you um, at 20% off. Um, if any of you I'll are- I'll deliver it personally. <laughs> If any you take the money. <laughs> if any of you would would like a copy of that, um, just ask me and I can tell you how you can do that. Uh, Matt will share for the folks on Zoom um, a link for you to go to as well as a discount code to enter when you purchase the book. One last thing, 
completely unrelated. Some of you may know her name, Brittany Dunn. Um, she has been a longtime colleague of ours for the last eight years. And uh, she is going to be leaving, uh, leaving us and going on to bigger and better things in Ottawa at the Canadian War Museum. I can't, her exact title is a bit obscure, so I'll just say it's a researcher. Yes, there we go, research fellowship. And uh, she is heading out actually in the next few weeks. Um, those who recognize her name may know her for her role as first book reviews editor and an editor of the Canadian Military History Journal for many years. Um, for those who attended our conference, she has been a co-organizer for many years as well. Um, and so we would like to say, I would like to, but also all the folks here at LCSC uh, would like to thank Brittany for all of her everything that she's given to the center over the years. She's been a wonderful colleague and a great friend to us all. Um, so do give her, uh, her your best wishes as you leave tonight, because we probably won't see her. You will probably not see her again, um, unless you're coming back to the colloquium, which I hope you do come to. Um, but yeah, I just want to say thanks to Brittany for all of her excellent work. Okay, that is all, I promise. All have a good night, stay as warm as you can, and hopefully we'll see you back at our next event. We'll let you know what that is in the very near future.